And our next speaker is John Stokes. John is the director of the City of Fort Collins Natural Areas Department. And the title of John's talk is Deep Advocacy, Clickbait Hazards and Collaborative Conservation. Good morning, everybody. I think my PowerPoint's gonna come up here in a second. Um, so welcome to Fort Collins. Thank you for being here. It's such an honor to have all of you here from all over the country. I came to the reception last night and it was really great to meet people from Arkansas, Ohio, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Montana, et cetera, et cetera. And when Darla asked um, you to raise your hand if you were from out of the state, um, many of you did that. So it's really cool that you came to Fort Collins. We're glad that you chose Fort Collins to be here. I've got a whole lot that I want to say this morning. So I'm going to get on with it. But before I do that, I want to talk just briefly about Fort Collins. You're going to have a chance while you're here to learn about Fort Collins. Uh, there are various sessions about Fort Collins, and we're going to have field trips and so forth and so on. So I'm not going to talk too much about Fort Collins this morning. But I just want to say a few things. Um, our city manager likes to talk about the secret sauce of Fort Collins. What makes Fort Collins special? And Fort Collins, you may or may not know this, but we keep winning all of these national awards. It's one of the best places to live, one of the best places to do business, and on and on and on. And I wish they would quit doing that because people keep coming to Fort Collins. It's such a fantastic place to be that um, people are pouring into Fort Collins. In fact, our city planner told us last year, told me that last year 9,000 people moved into Fort Collins, and we have 167,000 people. So Darla talked about the pressure on Rocky Mountain. We're feeling the same pressure here in Fort Collins in our natural area system. In any case, if I had to um, describe the top three things that make Fort Collins a fantastic place to be, one of those things would include our natural areas system. We have 43,000 acres of conserved land in Fort Collins. Terry mentioned that earlier. We've got about 6,000 acres of conservation easement. The rest is in fee ownership. And we continue to add land uh, as we go forward because a small group of citizens developed various tax initiatives that have been initiated and, and voted on by uh, the citizens. And, and it's an incredible thing, really, that uh, we have these resources to continue to conserve land. In fact, this year we've added almost two miles of additional, uh, two square miles of additional conserved land here in Fort Collins. And you know, in a community that's growing as fast as Fort Collins on the Front Range of Colorado, I consider that to be remarkable. So we're proud of that. And um, here's, a, here's a oh, wrong clicker. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Oh, no, I didn't do it correctly. So there's a little bit about the secret sauce. Um, before, um, one more thing to say about Fort Collins. Uh, there's um, a person here that I want to recognize uh, that is on my staff. She's a colleague. And uh, the Fort Collins Natural Areas Department has been in existence for about 25 years. The program began at about 1992. So we are celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. And there is one person who has been with us for 25 years. And her name is Karen Mancy. <laughs> and, uh, Karen is here with us. She was uh, helped develop the program for this conference. And Karen, could you just stand up so everybody knows who you are? So, and our, our program would not be what it is without Karen. She wrote the first natural arts policy plan, which kind of la launched us and, on, and got us on our way. Okay, enough about Fort Collins. I'm here to talk about some other stuff. And one of the things I'm here to talk about, or perhaps maybe the major thing I'm here to talk about, is advocacy which um, might be a little unusual for this conference. I'm not sure. But I found this on NAA's website, so I thought I'd put it up here. And uh, we're in this really kind of tough time right now, and Lisa alluded to that. Um, a lot of the things that we care about, good science, uh, additional land conservation, stewardship, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like um, those things are fragile, and they're under a lot of pressure right now. And um, you could argue um, that, in fact, we, we're going backwards in a lot of ways. And I just want to share one, one little factoid with you, and that is since about 1980, the amount of the federal budget uh, devoted to the federal land management agencies has dropped in half. 
So back in around 1980, it was about 2.4 percent. I'm sorry, 2.8 percent of the federal budget. Now it's 1.4 percent approximately. That is huge. That is crippling. We can't accept that, and and we have to do something about that. So. One of my core concerns and something I've been thinking a lot about is advocacy in the conservation community and how we get better at it and how we, how we begin to advocate more forcefully um, about, the, about those things that we care so deeply about. Because um, in, my, in my view, again, I don't think we're doing as good a job at that as we should and we're, and we're actually going backwards. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of advocacy groups in this country doing great work around conservation, and all of you are conservation advocates, and all of you have been successful at some form of advocacy and doing great conservation on the ground, but we got to do better than what we're doing right now. So um, I wanted to uh, press the right button and uh, bring up this gentleman. We're celebrating the 200th birthday of Henry David Thoreau. He was born in 1817. So he was instrumental, really, in the origin story of the American conservation and environmental movement. He wrote On Walden Pond, of course, and he was uh, kind of an irascible guy, and he was an individualist, and he was a romantic, and he was a transcendentalist. And um, even though he was instrumental in the foundation, really, of the conservation movement in this country, um, I would argue that um, we're kind of suffering from a bit of a hangover from On Walden Pond and from Henry David Thoreau in the sense that he was an individualist and he was a romantic. And we've relied on that kind of sentiment for too long when it comes to conservation. Yeah, it drives our passion. We're all passionate, we're all romantic about nature, but we have to actually get beyond that a little bit, I think. And then as I was searching on Google for another image of transcendentalism, Bob Marley po popped up. And I thought I would share that with you, and it's kind of apropos of some new laws that have passed in, in Colorado recently. Just want to tell you that what happens in Colorado stays in Colorado, so. Um, so here's what I want to talk about. Uh, and I'll explain this as I go along. I'm going to do an exploration of decision making and judgment and uh, type one and type two thinking. And uh, type one thinking and something uh, known as clickbait advocacy, a description of deep advocacy and some examples of what deep advocacy might look like. So um, I'm going to ask you two, I'm going to show you two slides in succession and I'm going to ask you a question. What is that? Don't answer out loud. Just, what is that? The next slide is a little tougher. Don't answer out loud, just keep it to yourself. What's the answer? Okay. The first slide is a dog. It's not a hard-headed mule. Uh, that's my dog. Sometimes she thinks she's a hard-headed mule, and it's really annoying, but that's a dog. And then 17 times 38, I hope that's 646. I didn't check my math. Um, but when you looked at those slides and you thought to yourself, um, what, what are those things? Um, on the first slide, you knew that was a dog. That was easy, right? That was automatic. There was cognitive ease around that. There was coherence. You've got a story in your brain about dogs. You know what a dog is. A dog is a dog is a dog. And that's what type one thinking is like. It's automatic. And we are incredibly good at that as human beings. We assess our situation, our environment instantaneously all of the time. And we, we look at problems that way as well, deeper problems. And our brains are fantastic machines at solving problems in an automatic, coherent way. But type 1 thinking actually gets us into a lot of trouble. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Type 2 thinking it's slower, it's deliberative, it's logical. When I asked you what 17 times 38 was, you, your, your brain slowed way down. I promise you that it did. And in fact, your pupils dilated and your heart rate went up. We know this for a fact. And your respiration rate went up. And you probably got a little bit nervous, right? Because you had to go to a harder form of thinking. Um, and you know what? Uh, we don't like to go to type two thinking. We like type one thinking. We're like cows in a riparian area, right? We don't want to get out of there. <laughs> we, we like to wallow in type one thinking. All right, where am I? Um, so this, this type one and type two thinking is described in this book, which I highly recommend uh, if you haven't 
heard of it or read it yet. It's a fantastic book by a Nobel Prize winning psychologist who explores um, these different modes of thinking and describes in about a billion ways how type one thinking gets us into a whole lot of trouble. So <clears throat> where does type one thinking come into play with respect to what um, might be called clickbait advocacy? Well, these two images um, are examples of what I would characterize as clickbait advocacy. So, you know, we've all seen these images and they're very compelling and they're powerful and they break our hearts. And we go online and um, I'm just a normal Joe. I, I don't attend natural area association conferences. Uh, I just have some avocational interest in nature. I wanna support nature somehow. I find an image like this online, it make, breaks my heart and I send somebody a $50 check or a $100 check. And so that's a certain kind of advocacy. And I, I would call that kind of clickbait advocacy, right? It's easy. It, it doesn't really require too much effort. Um, hang on, I keep pressing the wrong buttons here. Um, before I go to the next slide. Um, but, but there are a variety of problems with clickbait advocacy, and let me describe a few of those. One um, is uh, what, what can happen with clickbait advocacy is we can make some really strange decisions about how we allocate resources to conservation. And so um, there was a study done about Exxon, there are a number of studies, right, associated with Exxon Valdez disaster, and one of those studies um, asked people, how much would you say, how much would you pay per bird to save a bird from an oil-covered pond? And what was really interesting about the response is that the number of birds made very little difference to the per bird price that people were willing to pay, right? So 2,000 birds, 10,000 birds, 20,000 birds, 200,000 birds, people were basically willing to pay the same amount of money per bird. That's really odd behavior, right? It makes no rational sense, no economic sense. It doesn't make any sense from a conservation perspective. And, and we see this happen a lot, I think, when it comes to conservation questions and how we allocate resources. Um, and, and the reason that people have this reaction is because they're driven really by this kind of clickbait imagery and type one thinking. So, but there are deeper problems with, with type one thinking and clickbait um, stuff. Um, clickbait stuff, I like that. So, um, so while clickbait is really good at drawing ephemeral attention and bucks, it's poor at creating a long-term, deeper commitment to conservation. It's poor at drawing in that person I just described that wanted to write a $50 check because they care to have an avocational interest in nature. It, it's really poor at drawing them in and developing a deeper connection to the movement. And it's poor, really poor, at, 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 at driving, and I'm being polemical, I will admit it, I'm being polemical, I'm trying to make a point. And it, but it is poor at driving last, lasting social or political change. All right, so hang on a sec. I got cotton mouth. And no, no. <laughs> um. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what is deep advocacy? Um, this, this gentleman here, his name is Sam Daly Harris. And he, and he wrote a book, Reclaiming Our Dem Democracy, which I recommend. And uh, in the 80s, he was a classical musician, and he was wondering what to do with his life. And he was very interested in poverty alleviation. And to make a long story short, he started a group called Results. And this is a nationwide poverty alleviation effort. And it's a 50-state effort. And what he did is he trained just everyday citizens who cared about poverty alleviation he provided training for them to help them become advocates on behalf of that issue. So he helps them understand how to write a letter to the editor, how to give a talk, how to go in and talk to a congressional aide, how to talk to a congressperson. And it's a 50 state model. <clears throat> and it's been tremendously effective at raising enormous amounts of money to help with poverty alleviation and health care issues in this country. Um, whoops, before I go there. And um, I'm not sure we're doing this um, in our movement, deep advocacy. And I'd like to argue and share with you this idea that maybe this is a model that we would consider 
that the Natural Resources Association can consider, that all of us together in the, in, the, in the conservation community consider. Because if we don't do something like this, if we don't get our act together and start implementing a 50-state strategy to argue for our values and what we care about, we're going we're gonna to continue to struggle, in my view. So I'm going to give you a few examples of advocacy um, from the local to the national level. This is uh, at the local level, and this is a project you're going to be hearing a lot about in, while you're here, the Laramie Foothills Mountains to Plains project. It's a project I've been involved with for many, many years, and Heather Knight, my former colleague at the Nature Conservancy, is going to be giving a talk about this later. Um, but um, just to make a really, really long story short, um, this is a project in the northern part of our county uh, where we conserved uh, a landscape of around 140,000 acres that's relatively undeveloped from the Rocky Mountain front out to the High Plains. And um, this, this happened in the recent past, and it's a pretty incredible endeavor and achievement for a local community to do conservation uh, on this scale. And it happened because um, there were many, many people involved at the, ground, at the grassroots level, but also a number of organizations, and that synergy came, uh, built that, that that energy and that synergy helped us achieve uh, incredible success at the local level. So that's a form of deep advocacy, perhaps, but it's not really at the, you know, obviously not at the national level. At the regional level, you have the Appalachian Trail. I used to, that was where I began my career in conservation, was on the Appalachian Trail with the Appalachian Trail Conference, as it was then known, now the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And uh, this is a national resource. Um, you could argue it's administered by the National Park Service, and the Park Service delegated its authority to manage this to 32 volunteer trail clubs. So it's this really cool hybrid uh, public-private partnership, and it's an enormous success at the regional scale. And something that helped make this a success was the vision that Benton Mackay, the original planner and visionary for the trail, that vision that he had and that he described helped us become true, just in the same way that the vision that was articulated by the Nature Conservancy for this area, the, the uh, Mountains to Plains, was so critical to its um, ultimate success. So, all right, on to the national scale. I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. Citizens Climate Lobby. This, tall guys always have to lean over into the mic, I guess. Um, if, I, if you can't hear me, wave at me or something. But, um, Citizens Climate Lobby is a deep advocacy group operating at a 50 state level. So climate change, the killer threat, right, to everything that we care about. Progress on this issue has been infuriatingly slow, desperately slow. But how are you going to change that dynamic, right? And one of the ways that we might change that dynamic is to have this 50-state deep advocacy approach where we provide just ordinary citizens the tools to become skilled advocates on behalf of this issue. So this organization has helped develop the uh, Congressional Climate Caucus, I believe it's called, and now there are 54 members of the House of Representatives who are in that climate caucus 27 R's and 27 D's. They will not take a new member unless a member of the other party joins. That is an amazing achievement in today's climate. That blows me away that they got 54 R's and D's, half and half, to join in and say we care about climate and we want to do something about that. So yes, this form of advocacy can be effective. It really can. And there are reasons to be hopeful. Um, I'm going to finish up, and this last slide I'm going to show you is um, a quote from Walt Whitman, who was a contemporary of Thoreau, and he was passionate about our country and about democracy and about citizen engagement. He loved this country. And I love my country, and I'm sure you love your country as well. And I want to read this out loud. I will plant companionship thick as trees along all the rivers of America and along the shores of the Great Lakes and all over the prairies. I will make inseparable cities with their arms about each other's necks by the love of comrades. Thanks very much for your time today.